<laughs> how do I get a big red button wrong? <laughs> well, like, how, how do you know you're getting old? So, <laughs> okay. So, uh, so anyway, we're going to talk about that. And there's agile coaches in the room, so I expect to have a lively discussion around this. Just saying. Welcome. Come on in. All right, so let's get started. I'm just going to talk. We're going to use some real-life examples. And since we're from Philly, they're all going to be around Philly. Yay, right? Let's talk about this Philly special. You guys have to watch this video. I just pay attention. It's 12 seconds. <laughs> Still feels good. And watch watch this play again. Action. Snap, so not to the quarterback. Here. Quarterback play, whatever. Snap, everybody comes up, and, and here, here we go. go. What a play call <laughs> by Doug Peterson. This Look at him hanging out. Oh, you're not giving it to me. It you give it to him, and then he's giving it to him. And now he's nobody's looking at me, it. and I got the ball. <laughs> that was a freaking awesome play. How many of you guys watched that live? Yeah. Doesn't it still feel good? <laughs> okay. There was a plan around this play. Oh, I'm still trying YouTube. Hold on. But I've always tried. My husband told me to be careful about that. <laughs> okay. And, and I'm not a big football. Like I haven't played. Obviously, played football. I was a Redskins fan. It's a long story. I grew up in D.C. Interesting. You better now. <laughs> it's, hard. it's hard. Okay, so, but I love this play, right? Because it's, it was such a surprise, right? Because here's the here's the snap, but not to the quarterback. So they're trying to figure out what's happening. The ball's going from here. He's hanging out here. As soon as he goes here, these guys are like, "What the hell's going on?" And then he starts going this way. So they're kind of. Are we going that way? Wait, he's got the ball. No, wait, he's got the ball. And then by that time, Nick Foles is completely open. I and mean, this looks so brilliant, right? So my question to you guys is, do you give this to the team one week before the Super Bowl? When do you guys think Doug Peterson started developing the Philly Special? Sorry, he's the head coach. A long time ago. When? Practice, practice, practice. Practice, no. practice, practice. Beginning. I think he planned it. Well, most people probably didn't practice until a week or two before. Uh huh. Because oh. you don't want to use it during the season. Right. Otherwise, it's a one and done play. Yeah. Good point. How about when he actually said, "We're really gonna do this," and really said, "Okay, guys, let's get in a room and figure this out." Did he do that in August? Did he do it in September? When do you think he did it? In the summer. Uh, uh, yeah, I bet the, the conversations were in the summer. Maybe mm -hmm. it was just the coaching staff and the quarterback. But. So this surprised me, but Doug Peterson started thinking about this in January. Mm -hmm. And I find that fascinating. But what are the things he didn't know in August that he knew in January? Going to the Super Bowl? Well, yeah, that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. We're going to go somewhere. Personnel. Hmm? The quarterback personnel. Personnel. What do you mean by personnel? Tell me a little bit more. He didn't know Foles was going to be the quarterback in what? August. Yeah, it's a big deal. What else about the personnel? Who the competition was. Who the competition was. That's right. So there was some analysis that had to happen that he could not have done that would not have made sense in September. What about... Uh, other, other teams had used a similar play. Oh, okay. So doing some research to see like how, how much of that was out there if this would genuinely be a surprise, if Patriots would have seen this before and been like, oh, whatever, I got that. Capacity of the players. We don't know our capacity. What's our capacity? Well, I don't know how these players play. It's August, I could come up with this awesome play, but I don't know if I can trust these guys. I don't know if they can execute a play like this. I don't know who's smart enough to run this thing. So, Doug, Peterson planned like an agilist. He waited until January. So he knew all these things. The other thing he did not do was give this to the team right before the Super Bowl. So he waited till January, but then in January, he's like, let's get everybody in the room and let's talk about what do we have to analyze? What about legality? Is it legal to do one, two, three, four, boom, 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 boom around? 
I don't know. I don't read the playbook, but I'm going to make sure I t get in touch with the person who does. So here's my point about this, is that when you're planning right before the sprint, you have got all that in that, so let's lose Doug Peterson. If he had given this to the team a week before the Super Bowl, this is what we do to software teams. We give them all of this stuff to figure out. We just said, just in two minutes, we brainstormed all the analysis that had to happen about a 12 second play. That was 12 seconds, perfectly executed. And you had to get that in your muscle memory to execute that. You had to have that done over and over again. And Nick Foles talks about how he had to practice. They, they just ran it, they just ran it, they just ran it, right? I mean, it's just kind of learning how to ride a bike. You just run it so you don't think about it. So then when the time comes, Philly special, you just do it, right? So, but we do this in software. We give a lot to developers to figure out. There are some things we're gonna have to tease apart. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. How to set up a process where you're teasing things apart. Because the reality is, and this is from the Standish group, my husband has a Weather Channel app, and then yesterday he's like, oh my God, did you know there's pollen counts in here? Mm -hmm. and, and, we, and there's, scroll down, scroll down. Like he's all excited about all these features <laughs> I'd already seen. <laughs> and I'm like, yes, honey, I know about the flu thing. We only use 7%. People who develop software, we're only 7% of the stuff we develop, people are using. This is not mine, this is from the Standish group, looking across the board at how many features are actually used. I mean, there's a ton of waste. Most of it is my husband going, oh my God, after he's had the app for like three years. 7%, how do we make sure we're staying on target with that 7%? When we don't, have some type of process to do that analysis before we go into sprint. We're not doing correct prioritization. So we are not prioritizing properly. So Doug Peterson, for example, might have picked the wrong play to, to study, right? If he had said, it's a week before the Super Bowl, uh, I don't know, should we do the Philly special? Should we do this one? Should we do that one? You know, that type of thinking needs to happen a little bit before. We also don't get agreement on how. So what happens is we get into the sprint and then everybody's trying to figure out how to do the thing. There's some hows you don't need to figure out, you don't need to leave the team to figure out. So for example, writing up that play, making it visible, talking to the team about it, talking to the playbook people and making sure that's legal, doing the analysis about, has, the, have this, has this play been done before? Have the Patriots seen this play before, right? But also just running it, practicing it. You need to think about what are these dependencies? And we, we often don't get in to think about that. I, I want to bring up this $2 million project. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there is a huge dependency there on funding. I'm going to assume it's probably a, a public organization that was funding you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Does ABC department What's their funding model? Um, that's a huge dependency. We often don't learn those things till afterwards, but when we learn them, we now incorporate them. You don't want to be figuring that out while you're sprinting. And then finally, who and when. So if Doug had said, oh, let's practice this in August, he lost his quarterback and had to come up with the new guy. So you, you kind of have to get agreement on who, when, and how. Um, and, and what the capacity of all those teams are a little bit before. But you're going, sure, yeah, how do you do that? Okay. The problem, and this is why this is not happening in your world, it's boring. It's tedious and it's hard. Have you ever tried to get product owners in a room to prioritize what should be done? As long as they're buying pizza. Occasionally, pizza will help. I just throw objects. Unless they throw it at each other. Oh, that happens. It's hard, right? Yeah. It's hard to actually have a real discussion about what is our priority. And then to connect that to strategy. It's hard to do the hard analysis. So I don't really want to think about 
going back and looking at the, the report on this organization. I don't want to spend the time to read um, what's happening in terms of the politics of Philadelphia to see if they're going to get their funding. I really don't. That's boring. It's boring. But if we had, we might have said, oh, God, you know what? You know, last year they didn't do this thing. And they, 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 they had this other people and they didn't finish this. There might have been something we could have figured out. Right? These things are hard. And we also tell ourselves we don't have enough time to figure them out. So we think we have to write big volumes and books of things. But you don't. You really just have to add a couple weeks of thinking. So what I'm advocating is what SAFE calls a feature Kanban. We have a Kanban for sprints. Right, we have a board, we move cards. You guys know what a Kanban board is? Yeah. Okay, I'm getting nods. No. no, it is a board, and, and usually what happens is when we're sprinting, when we have a two or four week iteration, we have cards that each of us have decided we're gonna do, and we move them from some backlog to done state. That's just how we communicate with each other. That's how we tell each other things are getting done. We expect that whatever starts in the backlog is going to get finished at the end. That's our, our rep to each other. That's why we put it on a wall. Because we're saying, we meet every morning, like what's going on with your card? That's a con standard Kanban at the team level. So what I'm suggesting, and what SAFE is taught, SAFE is a scaled agile framework. You can reference this online. There's a lot of extra stuff in SAFE. This, what I'm talking about, has been teased out that I've seen work in lots of different corporate, corporate America places and lots of different firms. It's almost as if it's becoming um, like a truism, like a truth. Um, and it's a thing. It's not so, I don't want to get it totally associated with Scaled Agile Framework, but I do want to say that if you want to learn more about it, you can go to their site. What we're basically saying is we're, we're all kind of PTSD from having written long project documents. So we think that there's no project planning, right? Right. It's too much pain. And then it's a, it's a waste. So we've all thought in our mind that planning means a very long cycle. But it doesn't. It can mean a short cycle where we ask ourselves a couple of key questions and then and we can reduce how our cycle time and we can say it's only going to take us from this end to this end to get it done. So the reason I have, I call this the boring middle part is because there's always, um, I'm Jimmy Sorry. Dean, and uh, Jimmy Dean I wish I could tell you how I feel about it more than I could. I just think this is a really good French Philly we're going to. He's going to talk. Every boxing a movie has a montage. All right. So the montage, <laughs> yes, it's our guy. The montage <laughs> is always around, it's like five minutes. Maybe it's ten minutes. So you have like. This exciting part where we get to know you, find out what's going on with the person, we're all excited. And then, the five minute montage, and then they take a fight and make it like two hours. Okay, maybe an hour. But the reason this is always shortened is, and look how much work he's doing. Now he's like, ah, I can do one hour. Why is this shortened? Because it's boring and nobody wants to think about it. But this is the part that we have to work on. And note, it is always the longest part. If a sprint is two weeks, we really should have like a planning cycle ahead of that where we figure this stuff out that lasts about a month. Right? It's the boring middle part. I like to, and then I like to show, I'm going to, we're not going to watch the whole thing, but <laughs> here we go. This is the part. So this is like, I think this is like the product, right? And, and the developers are these wheelie kids. <laughs> and he's getting them psyched. So we've been through like state of analysis, the hard working part. Now we're actually getting ready to launch. We're in program planning, we're in sprint planning now. I'm getting my developers psyched about the product. That's what this is. This is us getting psyched, but we don't bring them in until he's already done all that work. He's already done months of work. He's already done the one hand of push ups. Excitement. <laughs> is it a fish now? <laughs> All right, I'll go to the end. We can see Rocky. He's in town, by the way. They're filling Creed too. Da, 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 da. Yay, there's a happy product owner, Rocky. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah! 
Yeah! Killmonger! No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay, so my point being, this is not this is this is a, a rule of life. This is this is not something huge or hard, and this is not like super method. It's just basic common sense, and I'm showing you stuff from real life because real life is about basic common sense too. And I think a lot of a lot of what happens in agile is people start to get like, oh gosh, I have to get so method, method, method. I've got to do my ceremonies, and you know, come on, it's just common sense. All right, so I'm going to talk about that. Um, let's assume that we have a Philly special feature. Who's the customer on the Philly special? Fans. Thank you. <laughs> what do they need? They need to touch that. Win. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> so that. We keep buying evil t-shirts and going to games. Thank you. <laughs> it keeps going. And the value to the Eagles is? Ticket sales. Sales! Sales! We still keep to go to the link. Okay. So that's a fairly special feature. And it's January. And we have to do a couple things here. I forgot to put why. We just defined a really good, clear why. So let's imagine we're Doug Peterson. It's January. One of the things I'm seeing that needs to happen here is a clear value to the customer. So we're talking feature level right now. We're not talking development. We're going to start development and do sprint progress over here. This is sprint planning. This is about a month from here to here of thinking about what we need to do. You can do this as a big board on the wall. If you have a system, a Trello or a Jira, you can do it on that. But the point is, what are those things? For you, I would have probably added here, figure out what the financial stability is of my client before I move it to the next stage. I think you guys also did great with cutting down into smaller pieces. Mm -hmm. So I think that's another key piece. And that might be another, what we call the up here exit criteria. What are your exit criteria for your organization? What, you want to keep this simple. So we're going to build these. That's what all this stuff is around the walls. We're going to take the next couple minutes and think about what it looks like for your organization. Keeping it as lightweight as possible, but answering the key questions before we start giving it to the teams to plan. So the wheelie boys came in about here. <laughs> yeah, it's true. We, and, and what we normally, what we have been doing is making the teams figure all this out. We're going to do a little bit of analysis before. So you have these columns. I have some very simple ones, new analysis and backlog. Backlog for the team. So it's not the backlog of features, it's the backlog of user stories. And what usually happens in organizations is you have the, the whatever it is here, in this case we defined the value for the Philly feature. Once we defined that value, we could move it to analysis. And in uh, our world, the Drupal world, there's probably UX that's got to come in. There's probably libraries we've got to think about that we have. There might be um, web design. We need to get some agreement on implementation. What kind of what kind of builds are we going to use? What kind of systems are we going to use? You do a little bit of agreement. You might bring in your tech architects at this point. You might bring in your defensive coordinators, the person who's got to read the playbook and understand the analysis. Has this been done before? You know, the, the, NF, the guy who knows all the NFL rules. And you bring them in here and you do some analysis. And then, once you're done with that, now you bring the wheelie boys in. Now bring the team in before the sprint and say, listen, here's the value to the customer. We worked out some of this stuff for you, okay? We still want you to come up with the solution, but we worked out a little bit of this stuff with some of your leads. And now you tell us what capacity you have. You tell us what you can do. What's your standard velocity, how much you can handle per sprint, and we will start to plan around that. And the other thing that happens with this is we start to do an estimate. So once we pass these two columns, we have a much better idea of how big this thing is. Is this going to be a week? Is this going to be two weeks? Is it going to be a month? 
If it's going to be a month, does that mean that we break it down a little bit more? And we ask those questions. We get that much better estimate. Then we move to the sprint. And at that point, it looks something like this, where we have, you know, sprinting, a little bit of practice in January, and then deployment. Okay, so, all right, before we do the build and share, what kind of questions do you have? Comments? I know there's coaches in here who are probably like, geez, nuts. Uh, yes. So, a common thing in agency life is availability. Uh huh. And so, on on my team, I always like to have the folks who are breaking down the project be the ones who are actually the ones building. But if they're siloed on an existing project, getting them free to do that one month or whatever, however many weeks that is, lead up to the actual sprint planning can be really challenging. So have you seen things that work for you know, small agencies where you can't necessarily, it, I feel like I'm robbing from the project they're currently on yep. to set this new one up for success? Yeah, so what I've seen, it, like I worked for Rally for a little bit, and what we did there was um, you, you had a product owner shepherd this through. And one of the things the product owner did was their mandate was to make sure that if they bought in the teams, they bought in a couple of key people from the teams, maybe not the whole team. And what they didn't do is have the team put a lot of estimates on something that wasn't clearly defined. Mm. So they didn't waste any of their time. That's the other benefit of doing this. If you start getting people to do user stories and look at stuff here so that you can get an estimate, you're going to waste your time because you haven't prioritized. You might say, oh, God, this, this thing is awesome. And then you go here and you go, oh, no, never mind. Right? So you, 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 you have... A lot of this is based on a product owner who is really doing, or a product manager who is really doing a good job of shepherding. And you work with the product manager to build these exit agreements, right? Maybe one of the exit agreements is limited time from the architects on the team. If that's, if that's a real issue for your organization, state it here. We don't pull these people in until we have properly prioritized and we know exactly that we want them to start working on it. But that becomes part of your agreements. So in Agile, we talk about card, conversation, confirmation. That's what this is. We have a card. We have confirmation. But mostly we have conversation. These confirmation activities should be um, leading to the right conversations with the right people at the right time. And I bet you, if you start to tease this out and start to think about your organization and how you work, you're going to find that there's some stuff here you're going to add to this column. And I think for you, since you've got people who are so busy, you, you know, one of the things you say here is, we're going to only bring in the architects, and we're absolutely sure, and we've done our analysis, and we're going to limit the time. We're not going to have them spend five hours in our planning meeting. Yeah. So I, whether you do it before or you do it, you know, at the time of the sprint, you're going to spend that time. So the question is, where do you want to spend it? Yeah. So in some cases, I mean, we're being asked to say, you got a building capacity for this for that kind of activity. So that takes capacity away from what you're building right now, because if you don't do it <coughs> up front, you're going to end up doing it when you start. So it's it gets it, so it depends on where you want to actually do that work. Mm -hmm. But just the building capacity and say X amount of time is needed for this. If you good point. Otherwise, it's going to going to happen anyway. You yeah. have to pay anyway. Pay, pay before you pay during you know, when you build it. So I, I work for a large bank and I, and I have the product owner said, we're going to Agile, which means we don't need requirements. You're just going to go build it. Right. And they're happy. And uh, But I have software developers who all have, I need a 300 page requirements yeah. document before mm. I start because I don't know what I'm building. Mm. I can't get them. I'm really strong with this. Neither one understands that, you know, the less design you give up front, the more rework, the more churn you have. So I may have a velocity of 100 points but you're only getting 50 because I'm redoing half of it every time because you look at it and that's, that's not what I want. Mm -hmm. But I got product owners who say, you know, I don't want to spend all this time up front. I want to reduce my market time. Can we talk a little bit, maybe not right this minute, but what are the, what are the techniques, what are the tips you're using that? Yeah, what's, and just to piggyback on that, so what does that, what's the output of that analysis phase look like? Like, is it multiple pages? Is it one page? Is it, like, how detailed is it? It's, it's the same feature. It's very lightweight. So, um, and this is what I've seen in multiple, and I work for Cigna, we put it on a feature. And we're big, super big. 
and we've had a lot of people who want those documents. Where a lot of people are, are weak in, in at scaling their agility is with a product manager, is with actually getting clear on this middle level process. And so once you start to say, guys, we're gonna actually do this, and we're gonna limit, and this is, what's, this is what's happening in major organizations. They're going, we're gonna limit how much time is in here. Even on massive initiatives that take the whole company in the whole year, if this thing takes us more than a month to figure out, it's deprioritized. They're getting really strict about that. So for those people who are kind of, and I get it because I've been in organizations where people have been there for 30 years. The only thing that really helped is doing these exit criteria with them, defining how long it takes to get from here to here with them, and we just put it on the feature. We have a template that we use that defines a very lightweight business case. It's actually in the feature, it's just a rich text field. And because of the visibility of this, the system, so most of these systems have visibility, everybody can see everybody else's stuff, you see that card, if you need to attach a couple key documents, but it, the, the agile mindset, you might also need a coach to help you to make the message that we're not doing big documents. Now for these guys over here, they gotta understand that this stuff and these people have to build smaller. So the other thing that happens is people think features are supposed to take forever. And really I think a feature should take about a month at, at most, right? You're producing a piece of shippable software so that's another p mindset. So you say to these guys, guys, I could spend a, a month building you a spec, but honestly, this thing is so small, do you really need a spec? Plus, don't you want to provide some information about how this should be built? Where's their input? Right? We want to leverage what we're paying them for, which is all that brain power. So we bring them in too. So that might be you know, something that you start to, it's a, it's a transformation and a shift, and I've seen it take anywhere from three months to four years. So, so yeah. How do you handle things that are like brand new? I don't have the infrastructure, I don't have, so these, these could be where your ultimate goal will be mm -hmm. maybe a year out, but there's piece, you know, there's interim deliverables obviously. Yeah. But you want to make sure you don't mess up like the, the architecture or the structure, because you could get down six months and find out, well, we, we have this other thing and it doesn't fit in. Well, so. the way I've seen that work is if you're building small, you catch it here in the analysis phase and you go, okay, we can't do that now because we have this big thing that hasn't built. And you deprioritize, you, you try to deliver the stuff that you can actually build and you make it really small. So you that's- You do some architecture. You get to do some framework work up front to make sure that whatever you build fits into that. Yeah. So, there's a, so if you identify, if somebody says, the product manager says, well, I absolutely have to do this thing, and then yeah. you get it here, and we don't have this infrastructure, sorry, we're going to have to deprioritize this. There's a dependency here, and when we figure this one out, we'll break this down into smaller pieces. Maybe we can deliver some value to you. Maybe we can put a little piece of that architecture in so that we can deliver a little piece of this thing, right? So you, the whole idea about it. Agility is breaking that stuff down into smaller and smaller pieces yeah. instead of a big one. But something, something yeah, do I, take a I year. I agree with that. I'm just saying that yeah. besides this, there may be a little more work if you're doing something big yes. that you have to kind of put some kind of framework around it that you that you build to, and then you then you do this for the pieces, right? Yeah, you're right. So there's actually another layer of Kanban above yeah. this, and so um, I didn't want to talk too much about that because I want to just focus on. Well, my assumption was it was mostly smaller firms, but we've got banks in here too. So I thought maybe, what can we do? But um, they call them enabler okay. features. Right. So if you Google enabler and scaled agile, you'll find that, that either, either this, either it's a big thing and you've got a Kanban board above this that, takes, that's, that gets done way before this other stuff gets done, or you break, break it down here into smaller features. But it's still called an enabler feature. Yeah, yeah it's all about the mindset and being able to break things down and deliver values oh, yeah. as quickly as you can. Yeah, you have a question, sorry. Yeah, um, well, so I'm like uh, analysis, backlog, in progress, and final prep, and done. So I'm just like, you know, that whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, I like numbers, so I'll spend about 10 hours in analysis for something that's going to end up doing 
maybe about a hundred hours of development work and yeah. you know maybe 60 hours of styling so if you wanted to break it down like so I'll you know they bring me in at Brown analysis right I spent about 10 hours doing that and then I yeah. you know figure out um, in the backlog I spent like two to three hours like breaking it down into all of the uh, the tasks like you know the who the when and the estimates so I can then get back because that goes out as a quote. I work in an agency, uh -huh. so we do about seven medium to large projects a year. Wow, so to the support are you doing something like this in no, your agency? No, 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 we, we have a completely different set of crazy. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was getting excited. I'm like, oh my God, that really works. Okay. It's just that um, the, the, the only difference seems to be the scheduling out of the thing, like mm. we, you know, because we're different, we're shipping whole sites and not just like adding features to a lot of things. It our output is more like you know, here's like three weeks, but we've planned enough and estimated enough, and then you know that also helps with the resource planning of you know of, of like who does who does what when and capacity and so forth. So, right. but you know, so it's like ten, um, three to a hundred. So. I don't know. No, those. So that's a really great feedback because mm -hmm. that you know what you're saying is I do a little bit of a little of, I take a little bit of time out and then I'm able to figure out what this this whole thing mm -hmm. is. So you already have something like this going on. You just haven't quantified it and made it visible for everybody so they can get off your back about stuff. Right. So maybe that would be something you think about as part of your exit criteria, right? That you have to present it back out so everybody's clear. Right. Yeah. Um, as you go through, but we we only have a few more minutes, so it's ten. Oh, ten for ten. So let's do. Let's have some fun. Let's mm -hmm. build out some combines. So you may not necessarily have these exact combines. You might have a few others in between. A standard and agile anti pattern I see in large organizations is they do put a QA column, right? But if you guys have external customers, so you're done with your build and then they have to approve, but theoretically you'd want them to approve while you're building, but that's a whole other thing. So some people put some stuff, the QA column, or you could add some more, and think about what these exit criteria could be. So if you want to break into groups, there's pens here and there. This is, um, this is a whiteboard, I think, so you guys could use this, and there's dry erase markers. And then those are little whiteboards there, and then that's actually just paper. And so um, I know there's some people who came together. Um, maybe there's some groups of people. Maybe you could use an example for um, for you know if you're not if you're by yourself. Maybe you can self-organize into a group where you guys can sort of think about somebody's example. And then what we'll do we'll do that for about ten minutes, and then we'll share back out. Is that okay? Yeah. What's okay. the, sorry, just to, to clarify, do you want us to break it down as you have up here, or? Good what? question. Um, you, don't, you don't necessarily have to. It, you could do this. You could say, what are my columns, like really high level? What might be useful for today would be to just absorb these columns and just figure out what your exit criteria are for each one. So it's kind of up to you. Mm -hmm. Some people may want to just say, I just need a basic feature combine. What would the columns be? And they may, be, may also be able to think about lightweight, what my exit criteria could be. Some, some organizations, maybe you just need to think about, OK, these columns look good, but what would I put up here? Mm -hmm. so how, how many columns have you seen? Like, can there be like an analysis like in several phases or other other sort of research that, that needs to happen there? But I've seen this like go out to here. <laughs> like, um, so it depends on the organization. So Rally has a product, um, a pro there's one product, it's Rally. So there, over here there's um, beta 1, beta 2, GA. After they're done with development. So they have all these features that they can toggle on and they have these toggling columns. Um, I've also seen, uh, I could mention the QA, but that's Agile Anti-Pattern, and I've seen this bump out a little bit. So maybe there's a UX column, and then maybe there's a, a web design column, or maybe they're the same people, I don't know, but it depends on your organization how important you put that column in there. Remember, it's all about conversations and visualization, and yeah, mm -hmm. So, should we do this?
this on anything? Or are you, are you, are you suggesting a particular feature or project? I think generally, what is the process for your company? So if you walked out of here, and you could take this to your product managers and say, hey folks, I think we might want to try this. Not on a specific, maybe it helps to think about a specific project. Um, so maybe that's how, your, how the thinking could go. But generally the goal is to walk out with some type of back of the napkin, here's what I think it would look like for us. I still look confused, people confused? How, yeah? How would that work as a group? Like, are we pitching some idea or something like that and just moving oh. it forward? Or? No, just sharing the idea. So, um, so if you, um, yeah, how would it work? So I, what I, what we could do, because it seems like there's some people that know each other that are from the same company, so I'm thinking maybe you guys should self-organize if other people are, yeah. I have a, um, the thing I'm working on is DevOps and I'm applying it to a new project. Uh -huh. So if anybody has any interest or thoughts on that, I can, I can group up on your own. Yeah. If you want to do on your own too, that's fine. There's extra paper here. Um, and there's extra roller whiteboard paper. You just have to cut it up and put it up. Um, no, no right answers, but yeah. And I can work, you know, I can work with you too if you want. I don't even know how much time to do. Can we pull track? Okay, good.
think we're ready to see it. I mean, we've seen it. 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 We've seen
and then also like uh, like high level strategy, like like so kind of like a catch all, just like hey, like uh, if someone has like a idea, and I'm just like, well, hey, well maybe we should do, maybe we shouldn't do that, maybe we should, or you know, we should maybe like kill something at like at the beginning rather than let it get to like execution and then, you know it holds us up or whatever. So yeah, uh, we we connected priority with yeah. You know, because there's external, like for the client and for the end user, and then there's internal as well. But we, we definitely felt like getting this actually spelled out um, it was super important. Um, and then the other stuff that we observed was like, because it's a small project, it often, it, I just noticed that in my agency, the smaller projects, we kind of uh, just whatever the form. It's like we don't keep the same. So like on the big stuff, we're very much like, oh yeah, we documented like lightly what we want to do and we have our exit criteria. But when it comes to the small projects, we're just like, yeah, yeah we're like yeah. throwing people on. We're like, okay, here's all, here's the context. Like we do the kickoff a day before production, right? It's like, okay, so blah, 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 like, now go. Uh, so yeah, keeping form and process even for um, the small, well, the small projects. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then, Practically, uh, we just ran into some sort of like baseline tech setup stuff, yeah. like our tech stack. That probably should have been like just dealt with before we got into production, right? What are we gonna need? What are we? What what like stack are we using for this project? That should have just been ready to roll before we like brought TJ on. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then finally, like yeah, the con all, all Kanban before production, like we're pretty clear that when we hit production phase, like we've got like the features and use cases and all that stuff, but we have never tried doing it for like, oh, do you have like features prioritized? That could be like mm -hmm. an actual thing that you move through the process. And like you can't start a production if you haven't actually completed that. So anyway, just a couple of things. Feedback from these guys? Some comments? Well, it sounds like this is this approach is really going to help. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. neat for sure. I say what I love. I love defining how we're going to prioritize. Mm. What makes us prioritize something higher than the other? I see that a lot of organizations fail around that. The they customer, haven't decided. When the customer says it's a priority. <laughs> right, right, right. Or, or when well, uh, when, when VIP of, uh, yeah. 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 the vice president knocks out my door, then it's a priority. Yeah. Well, we, yeah, we often, and I've seen this not just at my agency, but I've been doing this for like 20 ish years. And a lot of times, agencies especially confuse like what we're interested in getting out of a project with what our end user or client needs out of the project. And it's fine that those are different, but I think. A lot of times, it's not ever spelled out that this is a goal for X persona, and this is just the stuff we care about. Sometimes it's not the same. So yeah, that was a big deal. Well, that, that's not an invalid model. The executive vice president walks out and says, "This is number one." Yeah, it's a developer. As long as you're down, I just want to know yeah. what number one is. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> yeah. And it's fine as long as you've had that conversation, I feel. Like, if you know and it's like, oh, this one's up here and it's number two on our list, and it's straight up internal, the client doesn't care about it, that's still fine. Like, that may have an impact on our business, but, but to not go through that priority feels like a problem. So, so um, about the running the fight with the special and all of that, the Eagles actually, the day before the Super Bowl, had a whole practice of fake plays. Mm -hmm. So they they they, just, they you know they work them in so like so everything so you know the spy gate everybody's in the big uh -huh. chair you know and they just watch like there's like four people and they're like oh they did this they did this so they knew their plays like the day before and then just ran you know free plays and that's kind of how it feels it's like oh I'm doing all this stuff and then the VP comes and says no we're going to do something completely different you know <laughs> but the good thing is um, if you do this right. You could do that right before production because you know it's cold. Mm -hmm. You know, you're like, oh, well, we need to just reprioritize like these four things. Mm -hmm. Because we did it earlier. Right, yeah. because you, you already planned it out, you know, who's going to do what, you know, how long it's going to take and so forth. So it's just like shifting, 
you know, ice is melting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you see the problem that the, it's hard to keep these gates yep, tight? It is, and, and uh, that's that's a struggle. But uh, it, eventually, do people do start to get in line with it? I, I've actually seen that happen at very, like really big old companies. But it really requires people, like it requires people at sort of all levels to say this is how we're doing it. Um, and so we were talking um, with Simon um, about how at his level, it's like everybody above him is kind of nuts. So how does he do it from? <laughs> well, I have that too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> how, how do I do this for myself? And we were thinking, right. well, maybe for him, he does one and he put brings in the numbers. Here's my capacity. You're asking me for this one and this one. Here's all I can do. Right. You, you know, but I, this is my process. So you can start getting people used to this. People just have to actually start getting used to it, and they actually start liking it. Surprisingly enough, they start going to the combine. I've seen this happen at Comcast and lots of other big organizations, and they just go, "Oh, what does the combine say?" Oh, wait, and they they, they kind of rejigger their minds around it. But it, it takes somebody to start it. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we have one more, uh, this team, because I think we're running out of time. So, yeah. Um, okay, so our problem here was we wanted to apply uh, DevOps practices to a project that had already started, but wasn't too far along, and there were other, or other groups doing DevOps, uh, and, and DevOps practices. So we broke it into this, the what, so that's trying to define what exists already, um, looking at what languages are out there, you know, what tools um, are out there, what we want, um, and we, we looked at who are the cust who are the customers for, for DevOps. So it's really the developers, and then also management, and trying to figure out. Um, we talked about you know, what are they really interested in? They saved in the development, rework avoided. Um, and then also here we talked about um, defining what the constraints are. Uh, and then the how is figuring out what platform or platforms to use and then creating uh, an MVP or a prototype mm -hmm. of you know, just sample pieces and going through the entire flow of that. Um, and and so, so working all that stuff out and then creating your backlog and you know, breaking up, breaking up. That's, that's cool. We only have like two minutes. Any feedback for this team? I really like how you incorporated your MVP into the how phase because you know, instead before you engage the team to carve off that capacity mm -hmm. because you know maybe what you were thinking is it going to work yeah. like so you can save that team's time. Right. So um, you keep saying exit criteria, and because I'm not in the agile, I have no idea what that means. Oh. Um, but what we do at our, our job is, uh, so the what is usually what they call the solution approach, which is mm -hmm. something that customer reads and, you know, like, hey. And then at, after the how, my deliverable is a technical specification, so I get down mm -hmm. to fields. You know, like fields and settings, you know, like, um, you know, and then we have a, a high fidelity mock-up where it's like, okay, well, you know, the image sizes are this, the fonts are that, you know, that's all the design people stuff. Mm -hmm. But in terms of like knowing how it's actually going to be happening, we do that even before we scope out like the um, the task structure for a great depth structure for, you know, and how long those take. So if you wanted to figure out like how much information you have to generate in order to get the next two, three steps estimated, you know, if the developer can read and say, oh yeah, I understand this, then, you know, <laughs> That's, that's sure. it. Yeah. And this one is the exit criteria is how you protect the team, right? So it's saying that you can't bring this to the team until you finish each one of these steps. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay, that makes sense. Well, I want to thank you guys. This is you've been so um, engaged and awesome. Thank and you. thanks for the job. So, and all the stuff on the tables, even the pens, guys. You can take those. Even the pens. <laughs> <laughs>